get to know you by questions that you'll ask towards the end of my presentation. Or, sorry, it's noisy, I'm at work, so you know, you'll have all that intervention. But, um, or, or maybe you're able to reach out to me afterwards and ask any questions um, if you want to. I'll be able to give you my contact information at the end. So today I'm going to be presenting on addiction. That's my passion. That's my field mostly. I'm in mental health, but I do um, have a leaning towards substance use disorders. And so I know there's a lot of myths surrounding this disease. I know sometimes we feel that it's a behavior that we can just slap them on the wrist and they should just wake up and stop. And many family members who have members of their families who are addicts are not um, able to support them because of this stance that they've taken or this perception that they have of addiction. So I want to go through the science of addiction with you. I'm going to touch a little bit about um, withdrawal and just in general the problem that we're facing here in the United States and also in Jamaica and <clears throat> the rest of the world. Um, talk a little bit about detoxification and different types of treatment available. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have a question answer section. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Are you able to see it now? Perfect. All right, so I'm going to start with the definition of addiction. And just to say that this definition has significantly changed over a period of time. So it started out back in the 1920s as an allergy theory, meaning that, you know, people who developed addiction had some form of allergy. And then it went into this um, character moral standing, whether they had specific morals or not. And so the, the definition of addiction actually changed in 1968 here in the United States after there was a landmark case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And then they, they thought about it. They said, well, this is a disease and this person is a sick person. So the word addiction is derived from a Latin term meaning enslaved or bound to. What does enslaved mean? to hold you captive against your wish. And when we talk about bound to, what does that mean? Something certain or likely to happen. So it therefore means that we have little or no control. And that is exactly what addiction is. Once we get to a certain stage, it starts out as a behavior. It starts out with us abusing something and then it becomes a learned behavior and then it becomes dependent. And once it crosses that line, then it's out of your control. It's no longer, um, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to just wake up tomorrow and stop this. It's the whole process to do that. But I'll go through that with you. So uh, I'll, take, I'll skip over that. So addiction is a chronic disease that changes the brain and how it functions. And so we know that any other, any mental illness, whether we're talking about schizophrenia, um, depression, anxiety, we know those are all changes in your brain. And it's the same thing with addiction. So addiction is a brain disease like any other mental health disease. Uh, and um, oftentimes we don't see that. So according to the ASAM in 2011, they came up with this official um, definition. It says addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward motivation, memory, and related circuitry. This function in these circuits lead to characteristic biological, psychological, social, spiritual manifestations. And this is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and or relief of substance use or other behaviors. So this is a really loaded definition. But what it says really it's that it does affect all aspects of your life, your biological, your social, your psychosocial, your spiritual, and then it's some pathological behavior. So the person doesn't, norm, doesn't behave normally after this. It's all going after, it's pursuing constantly the drug that they're addicted to or the behavior or you know um, other things that they're addicted to like um, um, habits and so on and so forth. I'll get into that. 
So uh, let's talk. Hammer Can yeah. you put it on slideshow mode, the presentation mode? Um, they can see better. Or do you want me to do that? There's yeah. a request. Go ahead. Um, it's okay. <laughs> All right. So the brain. Let's talk a little bit about the brain. So the brain has this particular area right in this circular area called the reward system or the reward pathway. And this is kind of like the downtown area of the brain. This is where all the hustle and bustle takes place, right in the ventral tegmental area, and particularly so um, the nucleus accumbens. So just remember this term, the nucleus accumbens. So this is downtown. So this is responsible for reward and pleasure and motivation and pain. Those four things are really regulated by the reward system, by the nucleus accumbens. So the, here's a picture of it, this nice area right here. This is the downtown um, area. I'll skip that. So how do these, how does that work? So our brain is really a blob of cells all glued together. As you all know, you're all in the health field. And we have neurons um, that, ne neurotransmitters that work, work, you know, they, the neurons have neurotransmitters that send messages to each cell. And so that's kind of how messages are transmitted. And there are several neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, we know that when we are put in flight or fright mode, that we suddenly um, produce this neurotransmitter called adrenaline, right? And if we start hugging and kissing, we might produce dopamine, but in order for us to trust and bond, we produce this neurotransmitter called oxytocin and so on and so forth. So there are numerous neurotransmitters in the brain. But the one that I'm going to be focusing on today is dopamine. So dopamine is that chemical that is released that makes you feel pleasure. If you are not producing dopamine, if your brain is not producing dopamine, you are not able to experience pleasure. And so you have people, not very often, but you have people who suffer from not only depression and not able to experience pleasure, but a particular disorder known as anhedonia. And so they do not have the ability to experience pleasure at all. Um, but what if you have um, a deficiency of, of dopamine? You're not producing enough dopamine, you feel crappy all the time. And now all of a sudden, you find something that produces dopamine. What, how do you think your brain is going to respond? And how do you think you in general will respond? And so we're going to look into that. So there are some chemicals, unfortunately, and behaviors that does affect your dopamine production. So for example, if you drink alcohol, you, you produce more dopamine. If you smoke tobacco, or drink some coffee or smoke some weed, you produce more dopamine. If you're engaging in like a gambling game and you're winning and all that, you produce dopamine. If you are seeking comfort food, you produce dopamine. So all these behaviors and um, drugs and, and chemicals causes a release of dopamine, which makes you feel good. So because of that, you're, you tend to crave, if you're not having enough dopamine or you're not comfortable with the amount of dopamine that your brain is producing, then you want to feel better, you know exactly what to do. So you go to these drugs or these behaviors and know you feel good, you feel happy. You literally feel happy. So um, let's look a little bit, I'm jumping, but let's look a little bit at different types of addiction. So we have drug addiction, alcohol addiction, gambling addiction, food addiction, sex addiction, internet addiction, 
shopping addiction, video game addiction, work addiction, exercise addiction, nicotine addiction, caffeine addiction. And we have different types coming up. Every day we have a new one because they now say that anger is an addiction and sugar is an addiction. So um, I guess every, every year they're going to be adding to the list of addiction. But how does, how does one become addicted? So again, the drugs are certain kinds of behavior. We call them Trojan horses. And what they do is, when you take them into your brain, if you look under a microscope, these dopamine or Trojan dopamine looks exactly like the dopamine that your brain produces. So they trick the brain into thinking, this is dopamine and you feel good, right? So over time, you start depending on the fake dopamine. Now, how your body works is if you're giving it something from the outside and there is no need for it to produce it anymore. So it stops producing the dopamine all together, waiting for that dopamine to come in. And so now, if you do not get the drugs or the alcohol or the behavior, you feel crappy and you want to get that. So you go out and you use that, you feel better. You, sorry, you go out, you use that, you feel better. And so over time, it's a learned process, right? So these um, drugs, now what we call hijack the brain. And over time, it changes the brain's process. So um, I'll get into that a little bit. So it says addictive drugs provide a shortcut to the brain's reward system by flooding the nucleus accumbens with dopamine. The hippocampus lays down memories that this rapid sense of satisfaction and the amygdala creates a conditioned response to certain stimuli. So whenever we have any um, conversations with persons who are drug addicts, they will tell you that the amount of dopamine rush that they get, they compare that to almost like a sexual high. Um, it's not very strange for my clients to tell me that it feels like they're having a climax, but a hundred times more. And that's the effect of that rush that they get. And so they feel this sense of pleasure, like nothing else matters. And so this drug and this feeling that they get um, prevents them from thinking about any other thing. So if they have a problem with their family members or their jobs or school, they don't think about that because the level of comfort that they get from these outside dopamine sources is so much intense that it prevents them and it prohibits any other thinking process. So dopamine then interacts with other neurotransmitters like glutamate to take over the brain's system of reward-related learning. This system has an important role in sustaining life because it links activities needed for human survival, such as sex and eating, with pleasure and reward. The reward circuit in the brain includes areas involved in motivation and memory, as well as with pleasure. Addictive substances and behavior stimulate that same circuit and then overload it. So it's now going to change the circuit. It changes the brain, like it literally changes the brain. So repeated exposure to an addictive substance or behavior cause nerve cells in the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex um, to communicate in a way that couples liking something with wanting it, in turn driving the person to go after it. And this process motivates them to take action and seek out pleasure. So now they're all about pleasure seeking. Family doesn't matter anymore. School doesn't matter anymore. Job doesn't matter anymore. Every behavior is obsessive and compulsive towards getting the drug. That's all they focus on. So they develop also what we call tolerance. So say for example, some a kid in school started smoking weed or pot, they call it here, at 15. And two blunts a day was more than enough to keep them high and giving all the dopamine. Within maybe a month or two, two blunts will not work. They develop a tolerance and they need more. So
So now they, they have to do four blunts and then six blunts. Same thing with the alcoholic. They start out with one flask of rum. And my father used to drink one flask of rum and that's it. He's done for the day. And then you move up to a court and now you're doing whiskey with vodka and, you know, rare nephew and all that, right? So your tolerance builds up. And not only your tolerance builds up, but all your behaviors are geared now towards this. So I know that you're going to say there are functional alcoholics. And yes, they are. And there are problem alcoholics. Yes, they are. But they are still addicts. So, so like I use my father a lot because my father was an alcoholic. So like my father was a working father and he would work from Monday to Friday, perfectly normal. And on Friday evening, once that shop closed, he's drunk back until Sunday and he's functional on Monday again. And was he an alcoholic? Absolutely he was because I will show you as I move through that once he starts though, he can't stop himself until there's no more alcohol or he's totally passed out, right? So he did what we call binge drinking, right? And that's also another form of addiction. So when we talk about addiction, we talk about triggers. There are some things that trigger the behavior or trigger the want and trigger the need. And some people might be doing very, very, very well. Like they maintain sobriety for months and months, sometimes years. And they go back to an environment or they see someone that they used to drink with or, or smoke with and immediately they're triggered. And immediately without even thinking it, they've relapsed, right? So what happens is the hippocampus and the amygdala store this information about environmental cues associated with desired substance. So this is stored in your memory, etched in your memory, never get out for years and years and years and years. And so we believe that once an addict, you're an addict for life. It's not that you're cured, even if you are not using or drinking or gambling or whatever behavior for years, you still remain an addict and easily triggered at any given time you can, there, there's a potential for relapse. So these um, are stored and it helps to create a conditioned response, intense craving whenever persons encounter those environmental cues. So dependence and withdrawal. There are two main types of alcohol or drug dependence. The first kind, I'm sorry, let me turn this down. Okay. There are two main types of alcohol or drug dependence. The first kind is physical dependency. This means that the body has developed a physiological reliance on a drug because it has caused changes in the natural state. So the body is dependent, which means if you stop this at any given time, the body is going to respond. So for example, alcoholics. Did you know that here in the United States, when the lockdown happened in early March with the COVID, many of the governors shut all kinds of shops down, stores, hairdressers, but they didn't shut the bars down and they didn't shut the liquor stores down. And even if they shut the bars down, they didn't shut the liquor stores down. Do you know why? Anyone? So because of the physiological dependence. So if they had shut the bars down, the liquor stores down and people were in active addiction, what would happen is they would go into withdrawals, severe withdrawals and the potential for death. So for alcohol, that's alcohol and benzodiazepines are the two drugs that if you try to withdraw on your own, you can die. And benzodiazepines are those medications that we give for anxiety. So the Zoloft, the Ativan, um, give me some quick ones, Clozapam, Clonidine, all those are benzodiazepines. And so alcohol and benzos, if you're withdrawing from that, it's physiological. So you want to make sure that you withdraw under medical attention. You have to go into like a detox where there's monitoring. And here they'll give you Ativan or Librium. 
and um, that helps you to detox um, safely. The second type of dependent of withdrawals is psychological, which means the body is not responding. This is just mental. This is the brain. And so it means, therefore, that the emotional and mental processes that are associated with it um, will result in depression or anxiety or more psychological behaviors. So we have from, you know, mild depression to psychosis. Um, depending on, on how severely addicted and different types of drugs that you are. So my next session that I'll have with you, we'll look into different types of drugs that are um, abused and how they are presented. So I'll give you, because I mean, just as an overview, here in the United States, we have a major drug problem. It's like 15% of our population are addicted. But in Jamaica, it's no less because um, I'll come up with some of the stats that about 15.9% of people are addicted to alcohol there as well. So we do have an addiction problem all over. But here in the United States, um, more so we have the younger population using stuff like K2, um, heroin, flaca. Um, they have this new one called gray death. Um, they even use bed bugs here for drugs, and, and there's a drug that they make out of their own poop and pee here as well called GenCam. So there's just a wide range of, of drugs. <laughs> Whereas in Jamaica, we're talking about crack, cocaine, marijuana, alcohol for the most part. But I did hear um, a little bit of a thing the other day coming out. Well, it's not Jamaica, Jamaica, but it's Jamaicans that we're talking. And they were talking about this drug called lean, which is liquid heroin. And I was like, I wasn't even aware that heroin was in Jamaica. What, what more the liquid version of heroin? So I think sometimes we're not even realizing what's there. And with the population of the 40s um, and their drug use here, no doubt we're going to have um, different types of drugs being used. So we're going to have pill popping you know, that's a common thing here. They, they'll pop the pills or the narcotic medications that we can get a hold of. Or they'll go into the pharmacies and buy cough syrup that we can, we can just get over the counter there. It's very, very um, secured here. It's scheduled here. We can't get certain cough medicines anymore, but I know it's very available there. And so pretty soon we might have those, I'm not wishing it, but I know um, that, you know, people travel from place to place and their behaviors go with them. So we talked a little bit about the dangers of withdrawal. So will everyone who use drugs or alcohol become addicted? The answer is no. Not everyone will become addicted because the, the addiction is mostly genetic. It's 60% genetic. So if we carry the addictive gene, we have a relative who, uh, a grandparent or a parent who was an addict or an alcoholic or a gambler, um, or kleptomania, um, then those addictions will, will probably be passed on. For the other 40%, it's more environmental and other factors, which I will look into. So other factors that we talked about would have been like spiritual. So for example, the Rastafarians, we know that part of their rituals would be to use marijuana, and that could over time create a learned process and actually hijack the brain and causes the addiction, right? Disruption of healthy social support. So when we have a parent who leave and come to the United States and leave the children back home, you know, the abandonment issue, or we have a grandmother that's not so much in tune with what's going on and watching this child or other things, other social support breakdown, we'll have that trauma. Trauma is one of the biggest cause for substance use because trauma brings flashbacks and nightmares and fears. And so these fears and nightmares bring insomnia and other problems. And in order to get some sleep, we find that some people resort to smoking some weed or drinking alcohol or other drugs. And so 
when we talk about trauma, we probably will refer to almost everyone in Jamaica, honestly, <laughs> um, that has some has experienced some trauma. And if you're talking about like the um, the lower economic areas, you know, um, we call them the ghetto areas then we are really talking trauma because I can safely say that maybe about 70% of them have experienced, have experienced something very traumatic like watching somebody being killed or watching somebody's house being burnt out or you know, a fatal accident or something. So when we talk about trauma, that's one of the biggest factors as well. We talk about distortions in person's connection with self and also um, um, their higher consciousness. So we do find that a lot of persons who have psychiatric problems, we call it co-occurring disorders. So if they suffer from depression or anxiety or psychosis or any disorder like schizoaffective disorders or borderline, um, then they too oftentimes use substances in a way to self-medicate the, the mental illness. So a lot of persons who suffer from anxiety tells me that I, I take weed. And as a matter of fact, before uh, marijuana became legal in most of the states, at least it is legal in my state right now, um, we used to have these marijuana shops and you would just go and you would see the doctor, doctor, who would give you a marijuana card and marijuana. And you could go there and buy your marijuana and you have a marijuana card. And so if the cops stop you, you're medically, you're you know, allowed to take your marijuana. And so they used to do that a lot in the way they used to set up pill clinics to give drugs. You know, we used to have these pill clinics just pop up. If you want a pill clinic, go to Florida. There's a pill doctor right there. And you just get those pills, all the narcotics. So we're talking about um, hard, hardcore, not oxycontin, oxycodone, um, Norton, all those medications that are really, really highly addictive. They could go and just get these medications. And so they would so also self-medicate and not treat the behaviors or treat the disorders um, according to how they should be. How do I know if I'm addicted? Well, one, if I cannot control my drinking or my smoking, using drugs or stopping a destructive behavior. Two, if I get in trouble with the law and still continue to drink, use or continue the behavior. If it starts affecting my family life or my family obligation. So I'm not paying my bills because all my money are going towards this alcohol thing. Um, if it starts affecting my health. So we are going to look a little bit in some of the um, later effects of, um, of addiction and looking at health and how that affects them. If it starts affecting my work, schoolwork or career, if it starts affecting my mood or mental health. So the person, the addict is now a changed person. There's a significant impairment in the executive functioning. And I just want to tell you that there's so many studies going on in addiction, but there is one that really is of interest to me. So they're looking at the frontal lobe. And that's basically our executive functioning where we make these decisions. And they're saying, well, they use the analogy of a switch. So they're saying that there is technically a switch in the frontal lobe that switches on and off the brain when it comes to certain decisions. And what they've found is once the brain is hijacked, once the person becomes an, an addict, they, that switch no longer works, which means that they're not capable of making good decisions or any decisions that, apart from drugs anymore. And so that's why we find people who have lost everything, everything, every earthly thing you can think of and still continue to drink or use. That's because their ability to make decisions are not even, um, they're not capable. They've lost that, all right? So it, it, so it says 
impairments in executive functioning, which manifest in problems with perception, with learning, impulse control, compulsivity, and judgment. So people with addiction often manifest a lower readiness to change in their dysfunctional behaviors, despite mounting concerns expressed by significant others in their lives. And they feel at some point that they are unable to change, that they can't. Um, they've tried, and sometimes they really, 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 really try, and it's really a difficult process. So what are some signs of addiction? So there are cognitive changes. So they are preoccupied with substance use or the behavior. Altered evaluations of the relative be benefits and detriments associated with drugs or rewarding behaviors. The inaccurate belief of that problems experienced in one life is, are attributable to other causes than being a predictable consequence of the addiction. So they will rationalize their behavior to the core. Um, and that is just because they do not want to experience guilt, right? There's emotional changes as well. So increased anxiety, dysphoria, and emotional pain, increased sensitivity to stressors, so anything, no matter how small it is, is blown up into mass proportions um, because they cannot manage stress. Everything seems multiple, multiple stressful than what the average person would deem it as. So there's difficulty in identifying feelings, distinguishing between feelings and bodily sensations of emotional arousal, and describing feelings to other people. There's behavioral signs. So excessive use and or engagement in this addictive behavior or high frequencies and or quantities that the person intended, often associated with persistent desire for and on unsuccessful attempts at behavioral control. So they are no longer able to control. It's not in their powers anymore. Their brain's completely hijacked. Their personality has changed. Their brain has changed. That person is no longer the John Brown that you knew before the addiction. Excessive time lost in substance use or recovering from the effects of substance use or engagement in addictive behaviors with significant adverse impact on social and occupational functioning, all right? So they neglect all their responsibilities. Nothing is of paramount importance to them anymore except the drugs or the alcohol. I'm sorry, I skipped over. Yeah, so they continue to engage in these activities despite extreme consequences. And really they're narrowing down um, their, even their interpersonal relationships have changed. So they're changing their friends, they're changing their interactions, um, they're not um, being open to change or any discussion, they avoid, they isolate, that kind of stuff you'll see. So let's talk a little bit about Jamaica. Now, is addiction a problem in Jamaica? I know many of you nurses and other healthcare workers might think no, or you might say maybe, you know, and you might say, well, yes, um, it is a problem with our HIV population. Yeah? Um, but I think that if we really should peel the onion back and look, addiction is a really big problem. So when I was growing up, I heard that Jamaica made the Guinness Book of World Records, right? We had the most bars per, is it per square foot, per square feet, or something like that. Um, and we always thought that was a good thing. <laughs> That's actually a really bad thing. <laughs> we're saying that we're full of alcoholism or alcoholics. So according to 2016, National Drug Use Prevent Pre Prevalent Survey, 16.3% of the population are alcohol drinkers. 15.1, I'm sorry, I did say 15.9 earlier. 15.1 are binge drinkers. Underage drinking is at 11.7%. And I'm sure most of us can relate to that. I know that when I was little and my dad was drinking beer, he would just hand me the, the few, like if there's a quarter left in the bottle, I could get that. <laughs> 
and it wasn't a big deal. He didn't see it as a, as a huge deal. <laughs> Actually, that was something proud, you know, he was proud of. And if you were a boy, he would probably give you the whole beer, right? So we have 11.7 um, underage used drinkers. And for cannabis, we have 28.5% of males that use drug marijuana and 7.8% female with tobacco. Okay. Look at tobacco. Tobacco use is 62%, right? Cocaine and crack use have been tied to HIV with approximately 9%. Um, of HIV positive individuals using crack and cocaine. So yeah, so Jamaica does have a problem with addiction. Um, is there any facility that caters to addiction, whether it's a detox or a rehab facility, um, or do they give um, alternative treatment for, like we call it medicated assisted treatments here? So persons get certain drugs, such as we have methadone for we, heroin use is not a big deal in Jamaica, but we do give Suboxone for drinking as well. And Subutex, which is a shot now that we have here in the United States. And we do have a shot called Vivitrol. It's a once a month shot for alcohol. It, it's a blocker. And so persons, um, even if they drink, will not feel the effects of the alcohol. So it makes no sense to drink. And um, that's widespread here. It's actually being promoted a lot. So do we have those? I don't know, but if we don't, it's worthwhile um, thinking of. So let's look at some of the later effects of addiction. Physical, so we know that especially alcohol and like hard drugs like cocaine or heroin does destroy the human kidney. And it can be damaged both directly and indirectly over a period of years. The liver, that's the biggest one. The liver, we know that from alcohol and the DXM, we get cirrhosis of the liver. We get chronic inflammation of the liver. We get hepatitis of the liver and sometimes cancer, right? So we know that that's dangerous. You can't really live without your liver, so that's big. The heart. So my father died from a heart attack. And I have no doubt that that was connected, some to gen genetics, but mostly to alcohol. And so we have a big problem with alcohol drinkers developing potential cardiovascular issues. Um, they have cardiac rhythms, myocardial infarction, and you know stuff like that. Here in the United States, we have a much <coughs> problem. I don't know if you nurses are seeing that in your hospitals, but we have a lot of endocarditis and osteomyelitis here. Um, so we have people who use IV drugs and they come in <sighs> severe, severe endocarditis, severe osteomyelitis, septic, um, you know, paralyzed, that kind of stuff. It's really, really bad bad here. Um, and I don't know that we have seen that in Jamaica. The lungs, we know that from the smoking, we get um, respiratory problems. And crack also is being smoked a lot. Cocaine is being smoked as well as inhaled. So when we talk about crack or cocaine, it's not just about, um, you know, um, inhaling it. Also, there are so many plants that Back in my time, we were not aware of that were drugs, and now the kids are using them as drugs. So, for example, the morning glory plant is a big, is a common one here. It's actually now a street drug. Um, salvia is a common one. Um, they have this one called catnip that's common. Um, so they're using all these um, teas that we used to use as tea, like salvia is, is sold in the store, and it's now controlled but before it was sold in any drugstore as a tea, and the kids are buying that. Then there is K2, which is like a potpourri. You go into the store, you buy this potpourri. It's synthetic marijuana, they call it, and they're smoking it. And all these things are damaging the lungs significantly. And not only are they doing that, but we're, we're having more increase in overdose. So, here in Worcester, where I am, we're the overdose capital in the United States. So we have the most overdoses um, and overdose-related deaths. 
um, in the United States from heroin mostly or um, crocodile. They are using this drug called crocodile now um, or grade F or slacker. We're, we're having significant problems with those. We also have a lot of psychological problems. So I work in the nursing home and I can tell you that I went to one dementia unit and on that dementia unit, the oldest person was 55. 55. So what, we were, what we're actually seeing is people getting dementia from a very young age, from especially huffing. So what is huffing? Huffing is inhaling chemicals from like the aerosol container or like from gasoline or bleach. So they, they spray, they huff, or they put it in like cloth or cotton and huff it. And it significantly fries the brain. Um, so we're finding that a lot of younger people huff, by the way. So the kids in school, they huff. Um, let me tell you some of the things they'll have. Markers, um, white out, um, any kind of chemical that is in any bottles or anything like that, they'll have. Um, teenagers have come to me secretly and have told me that their parents have no idea that when they're sleeping at night, they're huffing. So they huff all the cleaning agents in the, under the sink in the bathroom and mom and dad has no idea until it's real too late and so yes yeah, so they will huff these things um and so they get real psychological problems memory problems later on we're seeing um so it's psychological but it's it's not just psychological it's also physical we're seeing more like we're naked carcassoff syndrome um, all those tied in with alcohol use as well in the dementia, you get young dementia units. Um, so we'll have more psychological problems too, like depression, anxiety, psychosis, paranoia. Um, yeah, we'll have a lot of behavioral problems. So we'll start seeing things like stealing, like children start stealing more um, to support their habits. You know, um, girls start prostituting themselves. Whatever it takes to get the, men, the money to get the drugs, they will do at that stage because remember they're changed. So there's no morals and certain things holding that anymore. That's all subdued, that's all, you know, under the, under the, the radar. And so whatever it means, whatever means necessary, they'll engage in that. We'll see also impaired fu cognitive function, which I talked a little bit about, changes in memory, changes in brain connection, um, brain cells. I'm going to rush because I want to be able to, for you to ask me some questions. So I'll just, just browse over treatment. Um, so treatment would include detox, counseling, medication that we spoke about earlier, and some evaluation and, and, and treatment of core carring disorders, so meaning that they're getting medications for um, other things like the mental illness and long-term follow-up and they need family support. So it's a family disease because not only the addict is involved, everyone in the family suffers. Everyone in the family su suffers. So I'm asking you kindly to be very supportive to the addict and um, you know, if just remember that the person is changed, the person is sick. Remember the person is sick it is not just a behavior anymore. They shouldn't just slap out of it. They need your help. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourselves and we have eight minutes for questions. Is it eight? Or Tavia, is it eight minutes? <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Eight yeah. minutes for questions. Questions, guys? Remember to introduce yourself before you ask your question. Absolutely.
And if you're shy, you can type your question and I'll ask it for you. That's right. Thanks, Octavia. But they shouldn't be shy. In the initial stages of somebody becoming like an alcoholic, what are the um, what are some of the things that you look for? To know that this person is definitely because you gave a distinction as it relates to binge drinking, mm -hmm. but they're all alcoholics. So, you know, what are some of the, 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 the stuff that you look for? So when you look for the person's frequency um, of drinking, whether they mm -hmm. start drinking, because it starts out usually with abuse, right? And that's when the, it's a behavior because you can stop it at that stage. And then it's so one of the things that they said, one of the main feature of an alcoholic is that they do not get drunk quickly in the beginning. See, that's my biggest fear of, of drinking too, because I know I don't get drunk easily. So of course I'll become an alcoholic if I continue. But yes, you want to look at the frequency. You want to look at how um, the behaviors afterwards. And you also want to look at other psychological issues going on with that person too. Because if there's problems, then there are the stressors. If there are other mental illness going on, then they might want to drink more and more and more and become an alcoholic. As well as genes, genetics. That's the main one. Look at the family of origin. Okay. Thank you, Ponya. <laughs> Carmen Palmer asks, you mentioned bed bugs. What is that about? So in the United States, and I know you guys love YouTube, so when this is all done, I want you all to YouTube bed bug drugs. So what happens in the United States is that the teenagers have found a way that um, bed, bug, bed, bed bugs contain this kind of um, chemical in there. I believe it's temporary or something like that. And what they do is that they catch them all, they put them in a, in a jar, and they um, pour, I'm not sure what chemical on them, and then they get that and they inject it into the body and it gives them a high and a major, major high, like a major high for days. So bed bugs, that was just, you know, a little parasite is now a big drug here. Another question? Come on. Well, Lucy, I see you have a question, but you're just a little scared to ask. B Meek has a question, well, a comment. She said, this is frightening. And Marlene Brown says, what is the best way to handle the new phase in the schools in Jamaica, which is the consumption of marijuana products? So I think that the best way to handle, especially with teenagers who feel that they're invincible and know everything, is education. We want to start by educating them from their very, very young about the use of marijuana because marijuana is almost normalized as this drug that doesn't do anything. Now, I have mixed feelings about marijuana being a gateway drug, however, because I don't feel that it is. Because, and I, and from coming from Jamaica, I argue that all the time here. If marijuana was indeed a gateway drug, then people in Jamaica would ask, would be using hardcore drugs. And we, I'm sorry. Sorry. And we do have um, people who have used marijuana just all their lives and not escalating to anything bigger. But marijuana does have an impact psychologically and physiologically on the body, and it is a drug and it's addictive. Devine Boudou says, um, can alcoholism be hereditary? Absolutely. It's 60% hereditary. So if someone, what I mean, if someone has a father, a parent or a grandparent that was an alcoholic, they are 60% more likely to develop alcoholism themselves than if they did not. 
but it doesn't mean that you absolutely must become an alcoholic. For example, I'm very aware that my father was an alcoholic and my grandfather and all my family. So I make it a point of my duty not to drink. And if I drink, it's very minimal and I don't do it on a regular basis. So I do not develop that addiction. But I have other addictions, but that's another story. Because we generally develop addictions. <laughs> yes. Uh, for Lucy says, um, can addiction be completely treated? And then she commented, maybe through re rehabilitation. So addiction can be treated. Can addiction be cured? No. It can be treated. Um, we have people who stay in long-term recovery. So, for example, if they're supported by a family, if they're on medicated assisted treatment, if they're in therapy, um, if they're in rehab for a while, um, that they can stay what we call clean here or sober for a very long time, probably the rest of their lives. But they are still alcoholics, they're still addicts, and there's a potential to relapse at any given time. Just remember that. I think you kind of answered Cardi Rodney's um, question. Um, it's, uh, hi, what about a person who are, persons who are dependent on opioids for chronic pain? You know that they are addicted. Should you turn a blind eye and give the pain meds anyway? <laughs> That's a big problem here. So 65% of our population that overdose here on, her, on um, opioids are 65 and older on prescribed medication. Um, so yes, they're addicted. Uh, there is a thin line because a lot of them really do suffer chronic pain as well. And so I know we're treating the pain. Um, here, what we can do is sub substitute it with methadone, which is also helpful for the pain. But I don't know that methadone is easily accessible in Jamaica. And so I don't know if we should turn a blind eye. Um, there are other medications like tramadol that is not so addictive that ha have been prescribed to that population. So again, I guess it depends on the person. I guess it depends on the prescriber and I guess it, guess it depends on the family. Cassandra Tuller says uh, a person who has, a, has to drink Pepsi each morning before doing any form of work. I guess she's asking, would that person be considered addicted? To Pepsi? <laughs> Did you know that Coca-Cola literally had cocaine in it back in the day? Did you know that Coca-Cola has caffeine in it right now? So yes, yes, we do. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, addicted to Coca-Cola because it does have caffeine. Um, Dayami says, can the patient with sickle cell disease become addicted? Well, I don't think there is a correlation between sickle cell and addiction. So I, I think addiction crosses all borders. It doesn't matter whether you are diabetic. It doesn't matter whether you have, where you're a sickler. It doesn't matter whether you have high blood pressure. Addiction is, stand, is a standalone and it does affect anyone and everyone who indulges over time and who has a predisposition to addiction. So sickle cell is not like a pre, a pre what I don't want to say predecessor, but it's, it's not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's not a predictor of, of, of addiction, but people with sickle cell could become addicted as well. Yeah, good question. Keep them coming. Oops. Uh, Venice Fraser, I think that's what we have time for one more. Okay. How do I help my brother who will not stop drinking because my father drank until he was an old man, so he thinks he has time to quit? <laughs> yes, that's one of the big problems, but your brother um, might be having different issues than your father. So he might start developing liver problems or lung problems or heart problems. And oftentimes we wait until it's too late um, to, to be able to fix that problem. So maybe um, what I would do is probably look at like YouTube or um, 
if you if you don't know like Moyer's on addiction and you look at um, there's a HBO series on addiction that shows alcoholism and its effects and you watch that person how they suffer from just having inflamed your um, liver to hepatitis to death slow the painful death then maybe that will show him that his his um, journey might be very different from the father. Uh, I guess maybe to explain to him how addiction is and how it affects your brain, that he could see it in a different light. But often, yes, I've heard that before too. I have one question. Can I get one in? Of course, Elaine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I just think alcohol in Jamaica is very normalized and uh, what you shared with me about your dad, I had the same experience, you know, where my dad is having his drink and he just gave me some, you know, here, just have a drink. And we just saw that as normal. Like, you know, the, it, this is like a regular occurrence. The other thing with the drinking alcohol is really tied to the economic situations. When you look at the number of bars and the number of persons employed in these bars, that when they're closed down, it really poses an economic um, crisis. If, if, if you know, if you want to think of it that way. But I've never seen any public service announcement in Jamaica to say if you have A, B, C, and D, you're addicted, or this is what um, addiction looks like. So if people are just going around and think, okay, I'll just go have a drink, I'll go to the beach party have a drink here, that when is that start becoming an addiction? And I've never really seen that addressed at that level in Jamaica in any kind of public service announcement. You're right, Elaine. I have never seen that in my adult life in Jamaica as well. Um, and that worries me that we're just pushing addiction under the rug. So we treat high blood pressure, we treat heart condition, we talk about those, but I never really see us taking up addiction, which is a spin-off of many of our other medical problems, and yes. really discuss it um, in depth. I think we minimize addiction in Jamaica, and it's time for us to start talking about it. I think we feel that it's not so much of a problem because, or even people that go to the bars, we know, you know, Mas Bada or Mas John go at the bar and maybe Mas John in at the bar more than one time a week or whatever. But Mas John have him grown a Mas John farm and he's functional. And because he's functional, we don't see that as a problem. So we have a lot of functional alcoholics in Jamaica that we really don't see as an issue. And because of that, we undermine the role of alcoholism in our country. Gee, I, I, I wish we could do something, you know, because now talking about it, how, you know. But I think we, we can. I think it. this forum is a starting point. I think we really can. I think we can. I think we have the resources. We have personnel. We have people outside. We have the Jamaica diaspora willing to help. I think this is a starting point. I, I agree. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. I know I've gone over time. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to you participating on September 17th, where I'll have the exciting um, presentation on drugs of abuse. I'll go into all the different drugs that are abused and how they're presented. So please join us on September 17th, but continue to join me because my um, colleague, Dr. Beverly Gordon is next. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we have a break for seven minutes, 43 seconds. I'm just going to put up the timer right here. You could, you know, take a restroom break and um, all of that and then come, come on right back. Okay.
no idea we can't put that on now because we have to we have use the, the internet so you have to wait